my hair. I know, I know, I saw my How is this hair? Because I want to She wants to take a picture. I want to get started. Hurry up, I want to take Thank you. Peter. Good morning, everybody. 10.30. We start on time. Take your seats. You are brave people. The fog, the rain, and you're here. Thank you. I'm Giselle Huberman, and you all know me. I'm the president of the James Wenwick Alliance, and welcome for coming this morning. It's going to be a great morning. Very, very brief introduction, because we want to get started with the real important stuff. The uh, panel discussion is materialism, the medium of the message, and the chair of this morning's symposium is Dr. Barbara Wolanin, a member of the board of directors of the James Wenwick Alliance. Barbara is a curator for the architect of the U.S. Capitol. She is responsible for the care of the works of art and historical records. She oversees the art conservation program, research and exhibition, and she also works closely with the U.S. Capitol Historical Society in managing the fellowship program and in planning symposia. Dr. Wolanin received a commendation from the Senate for the tremendous work accomplished by Barbara Wolanin in preparing the excellent book on the art of the capital created by Constantino Brumidi. Barbara, I got the book. <laughs> Everybody can take a look at it after the symposium. It is absolutely gorgeous. She does all that, and she also has time to do this for us. Thank you, Barbara, and welcome. Thank you, Gigi. Wonderful present. I get to work with 19th century art in my job, but I love contemporary art and craft art, so that's why I'm involved with the Renwick and uh, wonderful group of people. All the, a lot of you are here. So welcome. I'm glad so many of you came out on this rainy day. I'm very delighted that Elizabeth Agro agreed to uh, moderate the panel and that all of our distinguished educators agreed to participate. I put summaries of all their amazing accomplishments and careers and awards in the brochure so we don't have to spend a lot of time to, uh, saying it in, in front of the mic. And I uh, just wanted to let you know uh, Elizabeth has been involved in museums for 26 years. For the last seven years, she's been the Nancy McNeil Associate Curator of American Modern and Contemporary Crafts and Decorative Arts at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And she's really becoming one of the leaders in the craft field and the academic um, field of studying craft art. And I know she's going to stimulate very lively <clears throat> discussion. So we're, each person is going to present a little bit, and then there'll be the uh, discussion among the panelists. And at the end, there'll be time for you to ask questions or do comments. Just found out this morning this is being webcast, so that it's important if you have a question, you go to one of the mics, and it's going to be available on the um, SAM website for the future uh, if you want to recommend it to other people or watch it again. 
Thanks to uh, the director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, Bet Betsy Brun, and, and uh, the whole staff for letting us use this beautiful auditorium to Clemmer Montague, who's been planning this whole wonderful spring craft weekend, Joanna Thompson for organizing the lunch for the speakers, and especially to Katie Crooks and the other staff for this great technical support. Sure, your cell phones are off, particularly important because it's being um, cast, and, um, and, um, and I think you all know that the JRA, the James Renwick Alliance, is the support organization for the Renwick Gallery. Even though the museum is closed now, there are just an amazing number of events, programs, tours, trips being planned. So if somebody's here who's not a member, please join us. There's some membership brochures out on the table when you, can, when you come in. And uh, thank you and enjoy. Good morning. What a pleasure it is to um, be here today um, and, and a thrill. I was so honored to be asked to lead this uh, auspicious um, panel and this, this you know, cheer, lead off this wonderful uh, morning. Uh, I wanted to thank the James Renwick Alliance for hosting this and, and, and inviting me to participate. You all have been uh, an interesting uh, group to watch over the many years, a source of inspiration um, that you could support. American Studio Craft is it's extremely important, as you all know, and it just sends a signal to many museums, such as the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, to, to um, follow your lead and, and watch what you're doing and, and watch all the honors that you put on this wonderful and important field. I'd like to thank uh, Giselle Huberman and uh, Clemmer Monaco for, for having me, and a special thanks to Barbara Wallanen for uh, organizing this and keeping us all in line over the many weeks and months as we were leading up to this. But I also have to add that it's an honor to share the stage with such distinguished makers and educators in this field. And they'll be speaking in alphabetical order with, uh, in, my, in my world, Agro Goes Last. So it'll be Dan Daly, Peter Held, Glenn Kaufman, and Patty Warashina with me following up at the end to just sort of introduce ourselves. As it was mentioned in the pamphlet that you received, there's an extensive bio on each of us. Um, so we will not waste time on that. So I please invite up Dan Daly to speak. It's impressive to be here with so many friends. We haven't been to DC for a couple of years, but every time we return, it's amazing how many familiar faces we see and good friends we have. And it's just uh, the city itself is such a rich resource for, uh, you know, with so many fabulous museums. So we hungrily go around seeing what's on view. I'm going to give you a quick overview of my own work. and. Uh, this is a timed presentation. This is a uh, piece from a series of abstract heads. Um, it's, I like the uh, liquid qualities of glass, and I've used it to draw. It's a uh, piece called Vogue. This is a piece called Secret from the same series. I'm exploring the way uh, color in glass moves like watercolor. And this is a piece called Tough, same series. This is a close-up of a piece called Smoochers, which is in the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. That's a full-size view of it. It's a, the exploration of classic form in the series and also maybe a blend of uh, an interest in Etruscan bronzes. The vase has become kind of a pedestal for the sculpture. This piece is titled Aquilibrium. I like precious and deluxe objects. <laughs> This is a woodpecker from an animal vase series where the vessel form has been totally taken over by the uh, sculptural aspect. A white gorilla, an alligator. I try to emphasize the fact that it is a vase by putting a high contrast colored rim on each piece. A sawfish. This one could hold one stem of a chrysanthemum or something. This is like a slice of a car. It's called Latter-day Viking, a uh, series of male symbols is a portrait of glass collectors <laughs> it's called anguish and this is a piece about 45 year old love called likewise a pair of bird sconces k 
cast glass wings. I like functional art. I've made a lot of illuminated pieces. Dazzlers, the title of these sconces. The sconces to me celebrate entrance, they celebrate uh, a space, and they are functional. A vertical chandelier called Blue Dance, cast glass and blown glass, and nickel plated bronze. A much more horizontal round chandelier. Uh, this chandelier was made in response to a collection of paintings. There's a Gerhard Richter on the wall behind it that uh, has those colors. A figurative lamp. So in this case, the lamp is not really a functional piece. Walking on light. Uh, nude on a horse. They're fairly large objects. This one's uh, about holding on to classicism called wind. <laughs> An ionic column, a seven foot high floor lamp called the Swiveller. They're cast bronze, it's a series of six. Another one from a similar series called Upside Down Man. Um, an arcade at the Children's Hospital in Boston with three cast glass murals. This is Rain on Water. And Wind in Trees. This is in the auditorium of the uh, hospital. And this is stars over a field. This is another cast glass piece. It's a front door on a house in Rancho Mirage. It has a motif of canyons and clouds. It moves on, a, on an <laughs> axle. It's made of aluminum. This is a chandelier in the Providence Performing Arts Center. And uh, they didn't have a chandelier because the stock market crashed in 1928, so they asked me to make one. It had to be appropriate to the space. An entrance to a house in Stanford, Connecticut, and it has uh, a stairway that's uh, nine foxes running through grass. It's made of steel, but all the steel is covered. You don't see the steel, and it's uh, cast bronze with nickel plating and copper plating and cast glass for the heads and tails and torsos of the foxes. It's made with uh, sycamore and ebonized cherry. There's a surprise bird at the top of the stairs. So this is a case where somebody owned my work and asked me to transform the space in their house. There are some references to glass in the woodworking. Um, I like the way the bubble moves when we blow glass and that's uh, the, these stylizations of figures. This is a piece called Conformity, are a result of that observation. A piece called Escape. And then these uh, are individuals. I call these, this series individuals, a pair of sisters. A piece called Luminist. The sense of hollow volume is interesting to me. This one is called Art Official. It has, uh, he's got badges on his jacket. The one at the top there with the museum with the all-seeing eye is uh, about the conference of importance on works of art. This is a piece titled Wonder. They're not quite this size. This is a piece called Madeleine. It's about a particular pastry from the Alsace. And finally, a piece called Perspective. <laughs> Working with the traditional bust, I've altered it a bit. Uh, so my name is Peter Held. I've been a recovering artist for about 25 years. <laughs> uh, when we were structuring the panel, Elizabeth said, you know, just put in images of your work, and I haven't been a practicing artist for over two decades, so I'm going to embarrass myself and include a few, but I think uh, the reason why I'm here is the curatorial work I've done in museums. Uh, so these are two pieces uh, I made in undergraduate school. I studied with Bill Stewart, who some of you might know. Uh, really respected him as an artist. He was uh, represented by Lee Nordness, was part of the Johnson Wax collection. 
<clears throat> and at the time, uh, Wendell, both Wendell Castle and uh, Albert Paley were teaching at Brockport, and although I didn't take any classes from them, uh, you know, talk about incredible role models. They were hardworking artists. They were really gaining momentum uh, with their own careers. Uh, while I was in school, uh, Albert got the commission for the Runwick Gates, so a lot of excitement. Uh, rather than going to graduate school, I decided to go to the Archie Bray Foundation where I was a resident for two years, uh, situated in Helena, Montana. And I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with the activities of the Archie Bray situated in a historic brickyard property. Uh, it was really at the Bray where I sort of felt like I found my own voice, uh, you know, being uh, independent. Uh, from the uh, academic training I received. And at the time, the Bray was quite a bit smaller. There was only five or six residents uh, working at the time. Uh, I was interested in the early funk movement. You know, Robert Arneson was a hero, Eric Gronberg, uh, Bill Stewart, who I studied with. So white earthenware, flocking, uh, just crazy stuff. But, um, you know, I found after working at the Bray, I was working in the studio 12, 14, 16 hours a day, six, seven days a week. And I had other interests I wanted to pursue, and that was sort of the start of my move out of the uh, studio practice. I traveled uh, quite a bit in Mexico, Guatemala, visiting uh, pottery villages, archaeological sites, and uh, was inspired by the people I met as well as the landscape and all the cultural traditions. Uh, so this is the last series I work, uh, made uh, in the late 80s. Uh, on the left, a uh, high-fired wood piece that uh, was influenced by uh, Kiva ladders in the uh, southwest. Uh, always appreciated Membre's uh, designs. And then I became who I am now. Uh, so I had an opportunity to volunteer at a museum in Montana. Uh, really fell in love with the idea of being surrounded by objects and how those objects could be moved around to tell different stories and the opportunity to learn something new every day. Uh, I was director of the uh, Holter Museum of Art in Helena, Montana. Uh, it was a relatively new museum. Uh, they had opened in 87. I think when I arrived five years later, they've already gone through three directors, so they needed some stability, and uh, happily I was able to provide that. Um, Eleven years ago, I moved down to uh, uh, Arizona, uh, working at the Arizona State University Art Museum, a great building designed by Anton Predock. Uh, right across the street from the main art museum is the Ceramics Research Center. Sorry about that. Uh, Rudy Turk, who was uh, director emeritus of the museum, came to ASU in the 1960s, had a love of uh, ceramics and craft-based material and folk art and liked to intersperse and intermix all the different medias. He was also always uh, committed to open storage, so at any time we have 800 or so pieces out on view. <clears throat> and just uh, last week, uh, I left town last Thursday for Enseca. Friday, we just opened up our new facility uh, in a renovated Borders uh, bookstore. Uh, these are some installation shots of the current show I curated, and I feel like it's very relevant to the subject we're speaking about today. It's called uh, muck, accretions, aggregations, and accumulations, a uh, group show of seven artists who are very involved uh, with the material and an investigation of the material of clay, but are coming uh, from different vantage points and different uh, intellectual uh, ideas with their work. Uh, I can't remember why I put these up, just a couple of examples. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time publishing. I've published uh, about 12 catalogs or monographs. Uh, the last one uh, that just came out this spring is Crafting a Continuum, Rethinking Contemporary Craft. Uh, the ASU Art Museum collects uh, ceramics, fibers, and wood 
We don't collect craft broadly. We don't collect glass, although we have some pieces. Uh, don't collect studio jewelry. Uh, but it was an interesting show. It gave us an opportunity to see where our collection started uh, in the 1960s. Uh, the grant we received from the Wingate Foundation, we were able to purchase new work, so I spent quite a bit of time in uh, Sweden and Denmark to see what studio artists were doing there. Uh, so to bring uh, the collection up to the present and also to get a sense of where the field is going and what trends are developing. Thank you. Maxi-materialist, a term I've coined from Dan Daly's term materialism to describe my own approach in that I never feel confined to one material. And perhaps that's the difference that comes from working as an artist in the medium of fiber as a primary material. Fiber is open to expansive definitions and interpretations. And some of it isn't fiber at all. Uh, this determined what we call fiber is culturally, technologically, and personally determined and renegotiated at certain moments in time. If you ask me, what is fiber? I'd have to say that for me, it's an entirely open-ended exploration. I'm going to emphasize fiber. Uh, early training as a weaver, using wool yarns and linen and cotton and other things as well. Sometimes combining raw wool with linen in a pile rug. Uh, silk as well. This is a miniature. This is not a rug. This is uh, appropriation of a rug and McDonald's <laughs> and the whole idea of a prayer rug with a mirab. Uh, raw wool. Don't spin it. Just Get it off the sheep, wash it, and lay it into a plain weave ground. Uh, Rolag is a form of, of wool, after it's been carded, ready to be spun. In this case, this large fat object, here combined with linen uh, in a knotting technique, uh, but it became slightly felted through the dyeing process. Here's the whole piece. These kinds of works inspired by Native American and other ethnographic work, plastic. I fell in love with plastics in the 1970s, partly because of the incredible effect that light has on them, transparency, reflection, picking up other colors in their surroundings, and did a number of these woven polycloaks using a kind of weft looping technique, uh, a little bit larger than life size, not meant to be worn, and at this time, uh, garment as object became uh, of strong interest and continues almost to the present time uh, with inspiration from historic and ethnographic um, examples. In this case, there isn't a specific origin. Um, sealant backer rod used in the construction industry. It's a kind of spongy, um, tube, not, that's not tube, because it's not open, it's solid, it's a rod uh, for this large construction that was done in uh, twining, weft twining technique, which I was able to bring the loops out and form this three-dimensional uh, wall piece, which is, each panel is about four feet. Um, braiding, plastic tubing, uh, both in a kind of transparent version and in a black version. Uh, the title is The Knights, because I felt this had an armor-like quality, and again inspired by Japanese and other kinds of armor, which utilized various kinds of techniques other than just metal. Uh, this collection is in the Renwa, uh, is this group, yeah, sorry, is in the Renwa collection. Uh, also plastic, again plastic film, like in polycloak, 
but in this case black and transparent, forming this tunnel which began very black and as you move through it, if you chose to, through uh, a changing and evolving to transparent uh, where the light was at the end of the gallery. I did a series of these ritual objects, again based on ethnographic Native American objects using feathers and beads and a porcelain ceramic item with the word Johnson on it. So this was a series of Johnson sticks mounted on a brass rod and plexiglass base. Uh, I was working for a small area rug company, uh, Regal Rugs, in the 70s. And this show was at the Lee Nordless Gallery in um, New York. Uh, and I made a kind of environment installation, mini installation, uh, using a rug that was uh, basically nylon yarns and all in black and whites, a wall piece that included both tufting of nylon yarn and uh, vinyl, black vinyl and white vinyl, and some furniture and some fluffy balls to play with. Uh, I became intrigued with the whole I idea of glove, glove as object, and looking historically, you know, from ancient um, Egyptian tombs we have glove, we have at least one or two gloves from pre-Columbian Peru, and then the church, uh, fashion, you know, the great thing to give Queen Elizabeth was gloves for th birthday or dozens of gloves, not just a pair, um, for her birthday or for Christmas. Uh, this is these are very cheap polyester gloves uh, with transfer printing from found paper, nothing that I designed. And here's an image of the whole piece. Uh, then I worked more with individual gloves than with that combination that you saw. And this one, it's a cheap cotton, I can't remember, cotton or polyester glove, with a transfer print of a Japanese brocade, appropriated that. And the person who designed the brocade appropriated shibori dot technique into weaving. So it's appropriation over appropriation over appropriation. Before Michael, <laughs> I was doing beaded and sequined, or as you call them in, in Japanese, spanko is the word for uh, sequence. When I uh, started working in Japan, um, I wanted to do two things. One is slow down from doing these gloves, which are mainly found things, which I did things to, to getting back to the loom weaving silks as fine as sewing thread, which at first, of course, drove me batty, but calm down, go out, have a nice cup of green tea, and come back at a later time, putting on warps. Those of you who have familiarity with weaving and know what it might be like to put on a warp on a hand loom using threads as fine as sewing thread. So I started that weaving and also became intrigued with the whole idea of applying metal leaf, impressed metal leaf, Japanese term surihaku, and was inspired by the local environment, which meant, in many cases, looking down from places I lived or worked onto Japanese rooftops, kawara is a term for that, Japanese, and using a kind of abstraction of those shadow, light and shadow aspects that resulted with the sun, uh, on and then manipulating those images. I was commissioned to do a large project for an international textile fair and here using black silver leaf to create this six panel piece uh, which can be used in any configurations. Title is American Totems and I chose uh, uh, images, silos, chimneys, the World Trade Center, uh, Water towers in Wisconsin, um, a hotel in Atlanta, and designed these six panels. They're all of one color. And the reason that you see this pattern, which is inspired by American crazy quilts, is because each one of these different areas is a different twill weave, reflecting light in a different way. So every panel is the same colors used throughout. And the grid is something that I also was inspired by Japanese architecture. 
And most of the work that I did in impressed metal leaf incorporated the grid. Uh, there is a form of a garment from ancient Mesopotamia, sculptures from around 2500 BC, called Kanaukas. It's a kind of flounced or layered skirt or dress. And um, when Camille Cook asked me to be one of the representatives in the Polish Triennale at Łódź, she said, something dramatic. So, well, this is the time to do something with this Kanaukas idea. Simple, sort of uncrafted garden fencing and red plastic Athens, Georgia Banner Herald delivery bags <laughs> thrown onto your driveway to keep dry. I started recycling, but then I realized I need thousands of them. So I contacted the paper, and they were more than happy to sell me. Do you want the Sunday edition, which is bigger? Do you want the one that says Georgia Bulldogs? Or do you want the plain one? And I said, well, I think plain. So constructed these garments. Uh, and there were eight for the show in Poland. Then I did 15 additional ones for a show in, in Kyoto at the gallery that I show there. And then had the opportunity to show them in my hometown, Athens, Georgia. And there were 50, including the eight from Poland, the 15 from Japan, and additional ones uh, to make up. And here you're seeing part of that exhibition. So garments have been, kind of iconic garments have been a concern of mine in my work for a number of years, including <laughs> blue jeans. <laughs> because of their kind of historic origin, uh, denim, the fabric of Nîmes, France, denim, denim, white warp, blue indigo dyed weft, creating the twill weave that we all know as jeans. And then, of course, Levi Strauss jumped on the bandwagon and made what we call jeans. So I wanted these jeans as iconic guys standing in different positions. Uh, I first made the sample ones in Georgia, and they're, they're shown outside my mountain house there. Uh, and then I made a dozen of them for a show in Japan. And every day changed the arrangement. Of, this is a three-way conversation. There were guys waited up to go to the, waiting to go to the restroom. There were guys looking out the window. There were guys at attention, etc. Then I deconstructed. And I was thinking the recent show at the uh, Hirshhorn reminded me of my deconstruction. You know, I cut up jeans, threw them in the washer, so they pss, a lot of threads came out. But then I reconstructed them. So this is Bill Blass, the year of the cock, which is one of the years of the, ja of the Chinese, and of course in Jap Japan as well, Zodiac. And then I went all out with jeans. Jeans Festival, the Great Wall of Jeans, uh, the dart target with the women's jeans, because they're smaller and they work very nicely for this sun sunburst. And then a fashion wall on the left where I made things. I uh, appliqued jackets and vests, and I made many shoulder bags out of women's jeans shorts, and actually sold some. <laughs> uh, always inspired by something in Japan. Uh, these are based, uh, this is, uh, the term for this is nobori, uh, and it has a long historic tradition. Uh, first used, I think, for identifying various clans in warfare. You want to know who you were fighting against. So <clears throat> both uh, foot soldiers carried them, and cavalry wore them on their backs with the crest of their lord. But now they're used throughout Japan for advertising, you know, digital prints on polyester for McDonald's or the local camera shop or many, many things. And now, if you're aware of your environment these days, you're going to see them here in this country, inspired by the Japanese version. So I photographed them first on the beach, because I like that whole idea. But then I brought them inside. Uh, there were 10, I think, all together. And this is kimono fabric that I repurposed. And I changed the colors and arrangements every day of the two weeks that the show is up. So I'm into that 
lots of change. Come today, come on tomorrow. You're going to see something different. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I had a show in the smaller gallery uh, at the same location, uh, collaging handmade paper, fabric, stitching, um, bits and pieces of books and other kinds of material that I found. Uh, in addition to the materials, I've also collaborated with dancers. This dancer is a Bhutto uh, school dancer who collaborated with me on four, now four different ex uh, installations. Uh, also a former graduate student of mine who was fabric design but also uh, studied dance, worked with me for a uh, performance in this environment. And in the Jean show, Ima-san and her student uh, did a performance in the Jean's environment. Then, I w I f this was quite accidental that I ran across this piece. I was looking through a box of things that said, fabric in unmounted pieces. And it seems so appropriate. Domo, arigatou gozaimashita. I want to thank uh, the Renwick Alliance for uh, having all, I guess all of us out here. It's, it's a real privilege to be back in Washington, D.C. It's been quite a while. Um, Dan Daly's definition of the word materialism defines the philosophy of artists starting in the 50s who have passionately focused their life's work on a single medium, which is defined as crafts material. It's studio glass, fiber, clay, metal, and wood. I guess I fit this profile as one of those early artists in that studio clay movement, although I consider myself a second generation clay artist who started in the late 50s after Peter Volkus, Rudy Audio, Robert Sperry, and others did the hard work on the West Coast and initially broke ranks from the clay establishment by experimenting outside the realm of utilitarian wear, which was simultaneously being explored. The new clay movement seemed to be going in all different directions, including England's Bernard Leach, Danish modern, Minge pottery from Japan. And yes, I was one of those many victims caught in what I call the curse and never left. Here is a snapshot covering 50 years. And this is uh, early, um, this is when I first was in undergraduate school and I was learning, I got, I was going to be a science major and uh, I just happened to take uh, an art uh, drawing class and I just had never taken an art class before and I fell in love with the, the drawing. And um, eventually I took a, a clay class and then I never left. It was one of those things when you touch the material, and I know many of you in this audience probably had the same feeling, that it, it, the, it was the um, clay, the material that really captured me. Um, also, I was very much interested in painting. And um, uh, so I was looking at, a, you know, we have, being in ceramics, you have to not only be a, a sculptor, but you also have to deal with the surface. And so, in this case, I, I started looking at painting. I started looking at a lot of Arshiel Gorky and a lot of the Surrealists uh, eventually. And you'll see how little by little the abstract expression in which I was trained in, um, eventually you can start seeing literal objects in my work, say, say as this insect. And it, it started to creep into my work more and more. And uh, I started looking at people like Magritte, uh, the Surrealists, and they really, uh, I was captured by them, but I was still working in clay. And at this point, I had no idea that there was a thing called low-fire glaze or underglaze, because everybody was working in stoneware. And um, so I built these plots, or they're, they're about, I call them floor vases, they're about three feet tall, and it gave me a large canvas of clay to paint on. And uh, so I would start these uh, at nighttime, and it was pretty much a stream of consciousness. I just kind of let my hand go, use acrylic paint on top of uh, white, uh, white latex, and just kept painting. And the reason I'm showing you this particular uh, piece is because of the car image in the back. It was uh, something that was straight out of my subconscious. 
And um, this is a, I'm, I'm kind of jumping periods because you got to remember these are at least 50 years I'm covering here in about 20 slides. And uh, what this is is a period I'm showing that was a real breakthrough for me in terms of learning how to build with, with clay. And uh, all of a sudden I kind of, it just clicked. And I could uh, build, lay out these slabs and you can still see that I'm still in the vessel uh, because I was, you know, trained as a utilitarian potter. So I couldn't get rid of that vessel form, and this is a lidded piece called Moondog Dream, and I was able to learn to shove the clay back and forth uh, to get what I needed. Um, in this period of time, I, I'm kind of jumping again, and what I was trying to train myself to do was to learn how to deal with the surface. I wanted to learn how to paint on that surface, so I made these, um, they're kind of, it's patterned after a Japanese lacquer chest, you know, like food trays that my mom had that was sitting on my sideboard. And these trays, this is about three feet tall, and it's called Love It or Leave It. And um, uh, it's, it uh, denotes the seventh anniversary, the seven year itch. And uh, the, they all came from uh, these uh, drawings, uh, graphic dry, drawings, before I put them on the clay. And at one time, I had a, a big butcher knife in her hand. My friend came over, Pat, that's too obvious. Don't take it away. So I made it into a smaller knife. Um, and this is uh, the way the graphite drawings, they were about three feet tall. They were the same size as what I did on clay. So the clay version is on the right. And on the clay version, uh, you'll see that that's all fired material. I've now learned that I, I, could, I don't have to use acrylic material. I can now use this thing called underglaze. And uh, you see how things change from the drawing to the, the clay piece. And you'll see that she had a gun in her obi. And then on the other side, I changed it to some arrows, which, which was kind of a little more subtle, <laughs> I think. <laughs> and uh, the backs are, are kind of trompe-l'oeil, but also they're, they're done in very, very low relief. And, uh, and then the arms start coming out. And uh, I was not trained as a figurative person at all. When I was in school, you wouldn't be conceived dead taking a figure class. And uh, so, uh, you know, when, when I was on my own, what happened is I, all these images that were in my head were really figurative, and I had to kind of train my, this is how I got into the figure was by drawing. And the drawing was less scary than building it in clay. So you'll see how the arms start coming out forward, and eventually I start pulling the figure out. And the figure, this was one of the, well, this was the first, first figures, but I, I finally made a three-dimensional figure, first time, and I, I was so excited about the figure that I thought I'd just carry it on. I'll just do a whole series of, of, um, of figures. And the reason why the figures turned out about 12 inches was because I had, the first thing I did was these cars on the top. It's called Metamorphosis of a Car Kill. I did a whole car series. And after I did the car series, I wanted a figure to fit inside the car. So what happened is I ended up with these figures, and then, the, it gave me a chance to uh, do these narrative kind of s scenarios that were coming out of my head. And, um, and this one's called Automology. <laughs> and um, th I recently had a retrospective show, um, one in California, one in Seattle. And um, this is uh, part of the a retrospective. And uh, this early period of, of the figures are in the forefront. And this one's called Flying Shrouds. And I, I was very much interested in, um, you know, I, I've never been, <laughs> people say, you know, you're not supposed to do that. And I, usually I do the opposite, you know, when they say, say that. And um, there's one thing about ceramics. Um, you know, I'm kind of working against what the material wants it to do. And I kind of like that idea that the vulnerability of it. And it's kind of like, I guess, like glass. You know, you look at the material and you know it's not supposed to do that. And um, so um, in this case, I was trying to make, uh, uh, the figure run as fast as it could because you're not supposed to do that. And uh, usually when you work in ceramics, because the material, you know, you have this, you, usually the this figures are very frontal or they're very sturdy. And in this case, I wanted this material to look like it was flying around the, the flames. Um, this one also, what I was dealing with was um, this idea of time. So from one capsule to the next, you're moving in time. So it starts out at the left with, with a mummy, and then as it starts to open up, she starts taking her shroud off and emerges as, as an angel. And so I was trying to work with this idea of time like a cartoon. Um, this was kind of where I culminated this work. It was, uh, I was given a commission 
by the city to do, to do anything I wanted. And so I decided that the easiest thing to do was to do people I knew, because it's very hard to make up heads. And so I took portraits of 72 people I knew that were in the uh, visual arts. And um, I took 15 photographs per person, and then I started making, it took me about a year to make the molds, and then another half year just to assemble the whole thing. And it's called A Procession. And it's kind of, um, at this time in Seattle, what was happening, the arts were like really burgeoning. So I wanted to honor the, the visual arts. And so I picked this Ming Dynasty bridge because what it is, it's half of an eye. And when it reflects itself into the water, uh, you get the whole eye. And so that's uh, one of the reasons for this the, um, the bridge. So this is Michael Fagans with his be uh, baby Pepper. And at this time, I was still trying to learn about the figure. You know, I was t tell you, told you I wasn't trained in it. And I decided at this time, I didn't want the figure to look real. I was trying very hard to, to try to modify my work. So you see uh, Michael Fagin's leg, it's kind of like a loop. And what I'm trying to do is indicate speed and uh, also modify the figure and get it more streamlined. Um, this is uh, Margaret Tompkins, who is a very well-known Seattle artist um, over here on the hood of the car. Um, so um, at that point, I was so burned out <laughs> after doing this. Uh, it was about 10 years of work that I did in this small figure work. And um, I decided to jump scale. And I decided I, was, I went to four feet, and that wasn't a challenge for me. So I thought, well, I'm going to go, go all the way. So I, I started doing these figures, and I did a show um, of this uh, this work, and um, it was really kind of uh, the reason I did it was because I was challenged by the by the scale, and uh, this is a installation of part of that BAM show that I just had, uh, and also I took a trip to um, Egypt and all went all the way up the Nile, and when I got home, I I did this series and. I decided in the, out of the side of the temple doors, there were all these guardian figures. And, uh, and uh, my idea was when I came back to Seattle, I was going to make these, um, these guardian figures for a uh, post and lentil kind of um, archway. And um, this is uh, what came out of it. And um, I moved on. I, uh, you know, I'm skipping work, but th th what this is, is uh, it's called Realpolitik. And it's uh, moving my, the scale of my work. They're about five feet. And um, uh, I was moving my, my work down in scale. But what this is, is, is seeing the world as a circus. Because um, anytime you need an idea, all you have to do is read the paper. And it's, it <laughs> tells you something about the reality that we live in. And so each one of these figures represents the sideshow. When I was a uh, child, my dad used to take me to the circus, and it was a really thrilling thing to go. Before you went into the circus ring, you would see these, the sideshow, the fat lady, the woman with the mustache, et cetera. And uh, so I decided that each one of these figures was going to represent something in our society uh, that uh, would say something about um, some political um, idea. So in this first figure, this one with a guard tower here, it's called Tule Lake Retreat. And what it is, it's a guard tower. And it represents um, the World War II, uh, the concentration camps, and Japanese going to the concentration camps, and these guard towers. So I took the guard tower from an image and built it out of clay. And it's, uh, he's holding a flashlight on the other side, and his, he's got a very strange face. So that was what that was about. And I've kind of moved on to these other figures, which uh, you'll see on the next time that I show slides. And uh, this was part of the installation that I had at BAM. And uh, these figures um, that I moved into, uh, you see that the figure is now starting to get more streamlined. It's starting to get simpler and simpler. And I'm not sure exactly where this is going. But I also wanted to do the same thing with the, with the um, surface of the figure. I really wanted to get rid of those clothes. And I wanted to um, almost uh, as though an uh, abstract painting was flowing over the figure and clothing it. And uh, so this is what my intention is on, on this particular series. And it's called Conversation Series. Um, this one is um, it's, uh, <laughs> called... Um, uh, uh, pass, passage Through Venetian Light. And Passage Through Venetian Light um, is a piece that uh, was sitting in the living room, 
and I have Venetian blinds behind me, and all of a sudden the, the light was coming through and hit my coffee table. And I saw this, the, the slats on it, and I really liked that. And so I decided to put this, this particular piece together. And what it is is in the shape of an hourglass. And what it's talking about is ascension. And so these figures at the bottom are climbing, and as they climb, they become birds. And uh, so this is called Passage to Venetian Light. And um, this is a detail. And uh, this is a, a drawing that I did, and it's called Let's Go Eat. <laughs> okay, that's it. And Elizabeth, you're next. So in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to go through uh, very quickly. But I just thought it would be interesting, you know, we're here to honor our honorees, but it's always, um, I think, uh, a mystery to you all, you know, what does the curator, not, you know what we do, but you don't know necessarily how we think. So I thought I would show a few slides of how, what my art form is, the, the idea of taking your great works and putting them in my in my gallery. So, um, and Sika came to uh, Philadelphia in 2010, and I was asked to pick a handful of artists to show in the galleries, and so I had accepted Betty Woodman. They all responded to various things in the collection, um, and this is what we did. We, we, um, Betty was responding to the Robert Adams period room, and Paul Saccharides was responding to our Pennsylvania German collections. And it was very, you know, jarring for people who are used to our collections to see these contemporary works, but it was a first in major museums for this kind of interaction, uh, which was called Interactions in Clay. And A.G. took over a Milbach kitchen, which is a 17th century uh, Pennsylvania Dutch kitchen that usually is all white-walled. And she created a, a wallpaper for the room and created these um, vases for it. And then Walter McConnell, um, my, my curator in Indian Himalayan, gave me permission to create this wet uh, work that then is encapsulated so that it stays wet. Um, and it has like a, it's like a micro chamber. It has its own environment. It rains in there and everything. It was incredible, but it was so ethereal and our, our visitors were just struck by the beauty of this work. It was really a, a wonderful opportunity. Right now I have up uh, a series called At the Center, Masters of American Craft, looking at various aspects of our collection and honoring those makers, those who are well known, uh, someone like Sheila Hicks or, or that of Bill Daly, who's known um, in ceramics and, and known regionally but not known nationally. And then uh, two summers ago I did an exhibition called Craft Spoken Here, which uh, allowed me to sort of think about uh, craft and how to position it. And what I decided to do is really think about it as we should, as, as a sculpture, and, and show some of my larger works that I had never been able to show before. Um, so I, I looked at it as an essential element, the idea of line, and I installed a, a, a mixture of different works. It wasn't just one media, and there, it was also international in scope. A lot of my colleagues have been collecting craft in their other areas, in East Asian and the like. Um, it was a way of, of just breaking out this notion that craft is not just an American thing. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to showcase what I do best, installation, um, making sure that it didn't look, I find sometimes that we tend to clutter when we install. We have an opportunity, we're going to shove it all in there. But, but no, these things need space and room to breathe and to relate to each other. The next room is called Shape Shifting. Here you see a wonderful Japanese screen and a, a work by Michael Peterson, Coastal Stack, that I purchased in 2010. And then gesture, this idea of, of objects um, having a gesture and undulation and how they all, and the whole idea was about communication, how, how craft is an unspoken language and that it doesn't matter what nationality or what medium, that there are certain things that are very inherent and these things are inherent in art. And what the summation of all this was an opportunity for me to really pause and try to figure out how I would define craft. And, I think it's something we all struggle with. Um, and for me, uh, what, what, what it amounted to was an exp it's really an expression through materials, process, and aesthetics, which is deeply rooted in a craft tradition. Contemporary craft, in its many manifestations, conveys uniquely the spirit of making through the engagement of human hands. This evidence of the maker's hand and its connection to skill is greatly valued. For many makers, the need to innovate and manipulate materials parallels the desire to strive for mastery in a chosen field. Craft relies on this manipulation and mastery 
to achieve the power of ingenio, ingenuity. And so, you know, just to boil it down, basically what it amounts to is really that last sen sentence that really we've been struggling with in this field, what distinguishes craft within, and that's the key word, is within, contemporary art is the value of skill in the celebration of the maker's hand. And, and so with that, I'm going to ask Dan to come back up here. We we're talking about materialism, and this is um, uh, a formulation, a thought, a concept that Dan has thought up. He's spoken about it somewhat um, in the past few years, but, ne but it hasn't been published, and we can't have a discussion without him explaining to you what it is, what the thinking is behind his thoughts. So Dan, would you please come up? Thank you. Thanks again. There are a lot of parallels to, uh, to what we're speaking about, and uh, I'll just get right into this. Um, about five years ago, um, I quit teaching at Massachusetts College of Art in Boston after 39 years, and the dean asked me to stick around, so I invented a lecture series. Um, the presentations that I've made then at the college, to the whole college, uh, are based on interviews of artists who I believe are in the vanguard of an art movement, which I'm part of. My colleague in the project is Joe Rapone, who's a professor in uh, media arts at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. We took uh, PBS videographers with us to artist studios for the interviews. And we interviewed William Daly, Wendell Castle, Albert Paley, <coughs> Pardon me, Patty Warashina, Gary Knox Bennett, Arlene Fish, and Dale Chihuly. Those are the people that we've gotten to so far. Uh, all these artists went to art college in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, Bill Daly, who's on screen, entered the Army at age 18. And um, he became a uh, yeah, ball turret gunner on a B-17 bomber. His plane was shot down over Poland, and he parachuted into a frozen potato field, and he became a prisoner of war. This uh, engendered a lot of determination, I believe. He became a professor. He, he, he went to Massachusetts College of Art on the GI Bill, and later became a professor and a professional artist. He was one of the first artists in this movement and the first teacher that I ever had who was really a serious artist about his work, producing while he was teaching. I believe that many of us who have focused on a particular material for our artistic endeavors are part of an art movement of significance which has endured for at least 50 years. At a seminal point in our development as artists, we decided not to pursue traditional fine arts mediums. Instead, we were attracted to various craft mediums. As we developed skills and experience with certain materials, we became connected by the interchange of technical information and working processes with numerous colleagues. This group of artists became a large movement. However, there's no common philosophy of this movement similar to other art movements of the 20th century, like surrealism, for instance, or name one. The mastery of specific traditional craft materials placed in the service of individual artist concepts has defined this movement. The artists are materialists in the sense that they understand and employ specific materials, which in some way identifies their art. This differs from other definitions of materialism. <clears throat> in the philosophical sense, materialism describes matter and its motions constituting the universe and all phenomena, including thought. Everything is material, and material is everything. According to the MIT professor of physical science, Morris Cohen, materialism is a cultural term a description based on our genetic heritage, the human material. A popular current understanding of the word materialism is the gathering of possessions to the exclusion of spiritual or more meaningful pursuits. The art movement I intend to describe is based on another type of materialism. I think materialism as the artist's thorough devotion and accumulated knowledge and expertise based on the material they've chosen to employ in the making of their art. It's therefore a philosophy of material mastery which characterizes their work and unifies them in a movement. <clears throat> now, why does it matter? Why does this movement need to be identified? 
I mean, it's already called crafts, it's called studio this and that. I think it needs to be identified. These artists who went to art college in the 1950s and 1960s could have chosen to be painters. They could have followed trends popular with galleries and museums at the time. However, they built their careers on the use of specific materials, often adopting traditional formats, such as vases, such as chairs, to realize their thoughts as artists, and the craft mediums and processes became their palettes. This is unlike focusing on paint and canvas, and unlike making sculpture by carving marble or creating a clay model to be cast in bronze. The craft mediums bring with them a, le a heavy legacy of form and process, which causes modern makers to repeat history and to stay within the confines of tradition. However, some artists' desire to communicate supersedes their need to make product. Many of them do not feel connected to the craft scene. They just use materials and processes to express their thoughts. They're different from the potter making mugs for the craft fair or the furniture maker who has a production line of their design. The artists of the material movement are motivated by a need to articulate their thoughts and communicate them through the works they create. Many of them have had long careers and great bodies of work have been developed. They blur the line constantly between art and craft and they have little regard for how they may be categorized. <clears throat> I think it's important to record the words of these artists directly with no scholarly or critical or commercial filtration. These artists' recollections and thoughts reveal the most true picture of materialism as an art movement of significance. My goal in the lecture series has been to encourage the interest of scholars and curators to understand this movement. So whatever conclusions may be drawn about materialism, its vitality and importance as an American art movement has been established. I could interview many more artists, and this is only a beginning, but seeing and hearing them speak about their lives and their art is very compelling, and therefore I'm seeking ways to continue to develop this project. Not on my own, I'm kind of looking for partners in doing this. But I appreciate this opportunity at this event to focus on the subject and to have some dialogue about it and get other people's input. And, and finally, um, if anyone has anything, I mean, without seeing one of these pre presentations, you wouldn't know. This is a very quick overview of who these people are and some of the things that they make. And luckily, you've seen quite a few more things that Patty makes. But they're really pretty fantastic people who have had lives of great significance, I think, in producing art that's very passionately made and thoughtfully made, skillfully made, and yet um, it ends up shunted because it's not in the canon. It's not taught in art history. It isn't thought about by people who train curators. So I think this is an argument that I'm trying to make to get more attention to it and to realize, as Elizabeth says, it's within the art world and it's the way certain artists have chosen to work. It's as simple as that. Thank you. <laughs> Apparently, we're all to, uh, to come up on the stage now. Well, that was great. I hope you enjoyed that introduction of each artist and sharing about their work, but also um, Dan's uh, definition of what materialism, and also it's, it's really broken into two ideas, the idea of this idea of being, it being a movement, but also the project that I've, I've actually seen him present um, some of these artists in more depth, and it's a really worthy project, um, and it deserves to continue. Um, now, as you saw, by my own definition of craft, I, I implicate materials and process in that definition. But as you know, my training is a decorative art historian, and, and, and I am a curator. And I have the luxury of uh, what, you know, the, there's that expression when you talk about painting a bird's eye view and worm's eye view. And, and I have the luxury of being in both positions. I can be a bird 
looking down at the field and seeing what happens, and, and not necessarily at a distance, but sort of watching it and not necessarily being in it. At the same time, I'm a worm in the sense that I can make things happen. I, I sort of uh, think of myself as having fairy dust that I can use. You know, I have my, my scepter and I wield it for good in, in terms of the in craft and the museum work that I do. And I can make things happen. I can be a catalyst at the same time. And, and I, what I do believe, though, as this, this conflation of historian and, and curator working in modern and contemporary work, um, is that I feel like we have just begun to do the work to properly place craft into the canon. And, and there's so much more work that needs to be done. Um, it's very much part, I feel, of decorative arts history. And we really haven't explored that fully of, of, of reuni really reuniting it back into that dialogue, that discussion, where it can be placed within a long lineage of making, centuries old, in fact. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about that back to the Renaissance, in fact. The idea of studio practice is not a 20th and 21st century phenomenon. Um, and this work has to be done. It's crucial. Um, you know, we're we're going to webcast this. I hope there are young scholars out there that are hearing this charge. Um, and also time. Time is on our side. Uh, we need some distance from the field in order to look at it with with fresh eyes and not being nostalgic and not manipulating it by our own personal experience. Um, and so I see the inherent danger in creating another term um, to place the work of the artist in our field. Um, it further removes us from the art canon, the, 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 the canon that's already set up. And so I, I ask my panelists, um, what is your response? To, to Dan's charge, and, and what are the, I mean, and I don't think my, my thoughts are definitive. I think this is, a, this is a conversation, and this is a, a wonderful opportunity to discuss it. So, um, I, do, I, do I need to pick someone if someone wants to go, please? <laughs> well, I'll volunteer. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> As I age, my focus has become so kind of crazy and broad. I mean, during the period when I was starting to work in Japan doing this incredibly fine, mind-boggling weaving and this very precise application of metal leaf, mm -hmm. which was about a 10 years, mm -hmm. then I started thinking there are other things in the world and I don't need to be so focused on skill. I've sort of <coughs> gone the other way with skill. Like the red garments, I mean garden fencing, paper bags and one of those tacking guns, zip zap and a couple hours I had another one done. <laughs> uh, so my concern has been with, with the object and with the making, but not so much with uh, intense focus on skill. So when I did, for example, the banner ones, of course it required cutting, sewing, putting on things, but, um, and my next exhibition which I didn't show because it hasn't happened yet, but it's a whole exhibition on found objects, things I've found all around my days in Kyoto. Mm. Most lost items are gloves and keys. So that show will include glass, ceramic uh, pot shards, wooden things found along the riverbank, plastic, you name it. So. I'm sort of feeling very free in these days about moving away from what I learned as a student and what I did for many years. I think you're in, t in step with what, what's happening in the field, honestly. Yeah. Patty, do you want to comment? Um, I, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure about this whole idea about the craft uh, field being something where you have to learn something by hand with some extraordinary skill. Um, I think that uh, my, my premise is that a painter, say somebody like Seurat, Degas, Chuck Close, they all demonstrate a certain kind of craft in their, in their they are craftsmen. Mm -hmm. And so this whole issue about whether you make craft or whether you make art, I, I find it, uh, it, uh, it, it uh, to me, it's kind of disillusioning to the material itself. And I, what I found is that I touched the clay in the very beginning, and I was drawn to it because of the material. And I have to, had to learn certain skills in it, like I knew, had learned, I had to learn how to 
manipulate the clay to get it to a certain height. And over the years, I've added one skill after another uh, in order to give this kind of freedom that I, that I have now, which is now I can, it, it, I feel the same way you do in that now all I have to do is think of ideas. And the ideas are so, the hardest part for me is the idea. Once I get the idea, I can fit, figure out how to make it because I've kind of gone through that, that motion of learning the basics. But I think also a painter is the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a painter has to learn how to make, throw that Jackson Pollock <laughs> the dribble, because nobody can do that. And you know, Jackson Pollock did it uniquely. And I, I, so I don't see the differences. Mm -hmm. Peter, would you want to come? Yeah, it seems like uh, a lot of the first generation practitioners, uh, you know, they were starting from scratch. They didn't know about, well, <clears throat> Within the ceramic field, they had to discover what clay bodies could do, how to fire kilns, how to mix glazes, uh, because there wasn't a continuous uh, tradition like there had been in Europe. And that's why a number of European immigrants were so important when they came during a war, because that tradition had carried with them. So there was a, a obvious need to focus on uh, skill and learning the materials. But I think most artists that are successful um, always go beyond that. It's not about skill or the mastery of the skill, but it actually provides the freedom to do, execute whatever they want. And that's <clears throat> part of the issue in uh, universities and colleges now where the students are so interdisciplinary and moving from studio to studio so quickly, they might have interesting concepts, but they don't have the skills to execute. Uh, I think it's a good thing that they're able to explore because they're in a university and that's what they're supposed to do. And after they get out of school and if they continue with their practice, they'll pick up any skill they need or outsource. Right. Well, you brought, you both, you, you brought up a really interesting point and so did you, Patty. I think speaking to Peter's point, I mean, in these you know, programs um, that are nationwide, you know, focusing on craft, there are huge changes that have happened and are, are at a, a foot. Um, in fact, in some cases, they are collapsing the craft programs and they are merging the different um, material disciplines into, for example, they would take away clay, glass, and maybe metals um, and, and collapse it into sculpture or 3D. And not to say that you can't do that material, but you, you are now under one, uh, one umbrella. Um, in some cases, they're dissolving um, de various uh, focuses. So um, the other flip side of this is that they're finding that their undergrad and graduate students are not interested in committing to one material. They're not, they're not following this first generation of making where they are devoted to one material. Um, they want to explore it all and, and given their age, um, they should. Um, so it should be really interesting and I, I guess I pose my first question, you as, as former educators, um, I would think, would you agree that it's going to extremely change the landscape of what the field is going to look like once they graduate? I mean, they may come out of program and say, well, I really did like clay, and that's the, the, the material that I might most express myself in, but they might not. And it, it should be really interesting to see what is being made in the next few years. And I'm curious what your, all four of you, what your take might be on that. Yeah, well, at Georgia, I. When I, when I left Cranbrook and went to Georgia, my, I was given you know, open book, open budget, mm -hmm. to do the kind of program that I felt was important. If I wanted to, to create a program that would prepare students that I would have had at Cranbrook, if that makes any sense at all. So I, w I wanted to make sure that they knew structure, which meant weaving and other non-woven structures. I wanted to make sure that they knew something about surface design and dyeing. And I wanted to know, and I wanted them to have the opportunity to, to explore the combination of these kind of things. And I developed three courses in the history of fabrics. One from the Stone Age to the present, one in Peruvian textiles, which we also had a collection. Uh, I established a collection of, of uh, historic materials mm -hmm. within the School of Art, which is not common. And I uh, established a course Stone Age to the present, proven textiles and Japanese textiles because by that time I'd spent a lot of time there. Uh, now that I've left, that program has changed quite a bit. It's now basically a design program. 
but the weaving, the looms are still clicking away, <laughs> and the screen printing is too, right. but the history courses have sort of gone by the wayside, and the experimental courses have gone by the wayside. So I know many craft programs are condensing, but in terms of, uh, and the other things at Georgia, I think the metal program is still going strong, the clay program is still going strong, and students do put their toes in. I mean, a lot of sculpture students using fabric or fiber in some way, mm -hmm. which was, I don't know, a development that just sort of Organ happened. Organically no. happened, yeah, you're, you're seeing but that. But the crafts themselves, at least at Georgia, uh, are still strong in each of those areas, but ours is more of a design program and preparing students with very sophisticated portfolios. However, there's not that many jobs out there in industry anymore. That's true. Well, the, um, it's, first of all, schools have a tendency to, especially when in these uh, media arts, to uh, develop these kind of fiefdoms where um, budget becomes a kind of a driver of mm -hmm. curriculum in a funny way. And so um, it's unfortunate that you can't maintain that kind of flexibility as an educator if you build a serious studio that costs 40,000 bucks to build a new furnace, or you have to have it running 24 hours a day because that's the nature of the beast. Um, and it's heavy facility is typical of all these media arts. It's not like a painting studio. It's not portable really much mm -hmm. at all. So as a consequence, I think a lot of um, departments got built up and at the same time, students, uh, uh, we've had years at MassArt where there were three majors in fibers and all of a sudden now they're 27. These things go up and down. It, they consequently, they named, renamed everything Fine Arts 3D, which makes a lot of sense. It's been that way since I got there. And the, um, the whole, uh, notion of having one medium and one major, you're right, has been changing. The, um, but that's typical and I think it's gonna continue to change. Students are not predictable, they shouldn't be. No, exactly. The, um, the other thing about the, um, the idea of putting a name on this movement to go back to that first uh, question you posed, the reason I was compelled to do that is because I really think it's important to note that within the greater thing that everybody calls the crafts, mm -hmm. there are quite a lot of artists who have done it in a different way, and they just happen to use these methods and, and processes, and at the same time, they've adopted formats. So when I mentioned that somebody might be making a vase like me, or Gary Knox Bennett uses a chair as his format, he could also take a a square of canvas and make a picture on it. But instead, he takes a whole bunch of shapes, sticks them together, calls it a table. It's his composition. You could turn it upside down, it would still, mm -hmm. in a funny way, mean something. So I don't feel like it's, uh, I do feel like it's necessary at some level to put a definition on this uh, movement. I wouldn't debate that. I, I think it's just a matter of, I think we need time, personally. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that your title for it is wrong. I just feel we are in uncertain waters and, it, and we just need to yeah, let the time. Words kind of yeah, I mean, it, yeah, no, it's true. It's true. And um, I think what um, something that Patty had said, uh, you know, about, um, you know, th about painting versus craft or three-dimensional. In a way, again, I, I could speak because of my training to an age-old debate, and a debate that took place in the Renaissance that Leonardo da Vinci um, published, and it's called the Paragone, and it's the, the de debate between uh, paintings versus sculpture. And when you read it, the Paragone, it, it talks about which was the, the more uh, finer art. Was it painting or sculpture? And and I thought, you know, reading that paper back at Mary Washington back in 1987, I never thought that I would be able to reference that in this moment. But in a sense, it's very relevant um, because it's still, the debate still <laughs> continues, um, ironically. And, and so just to think about these courtiers debating eloquently about this, these two things, and it, it really, uh, well, I, you know, I, that's, really a, that's a reading assignment for everyone. You have to go and find what, Paragonic. What upsets me is... Um, if you make it in one material, it's considered art. 
And if you make it in another material, it's it's uh, craft. Uh, and what I my difference is like, I had I made a sculpture. I mean, I made a piece right. of craft. <laughs> but it's a sculpture. Let's just say sculpture. I and mean. I okay, I made it. I made a I made a figure in clay, and it was uh, nine feet tall. It was cast in bronze. Now is that is that <laughs> is that craft or is it art? You know, yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's just like so silly. Well, that's why it's you know in this debate, and it's really funny. And when I think about. Uh, the teacher asked us to choose, the professor asked us to choose which side of the debate, and I chose sculpture, which was the harder argument to make. And it's kind of funny that here I am doing what I do, uh -huh. however many years later, and, and I think it, it, it does hold true. I think we're, for, we're forgetting that this 3D work, yes, it's called craft, that's what we've been calling it, it was given that name for whatever purposes, we can spend another lecture on just on that, but it is sculpture, that's what these things are, and I think we need to embrace that. I think my colleagues and my, myself, we've agreed that we've moved on beyond that debate. Uh, we've just decided these things are art and they fall under the sculpture rubric. Some of us feel very strongly that they fall under decorative arts, applied arts, if you will, and, and feel very strongly that even though uh, decorative arts has always been second to fine arts. Um, Why is it second to fine arts? Well, because, you know, like if you've ever been through the Frick, the paintings are what's important and the, and the French, very important, I might add, 18th century <laughs> French furniture that's underneath it that is like probably one of the best collections on the East Coast kind of is subservient to it. Why? You know, maybe it's the, the again, the age old, um, if you look back in the papers of 15th and 16th century Italian texts, artists um, spoke to their own work. Cellini himself, you know, arte minori and arte majori, major works and minor works. And maybe those words got mangled along the way of, you know, John Bologna used these terms about his sculpture and also his metalwork and, and also sugar sculptures that appeared on the table. Somehow, maybe, you know, some art historian in his twisted mind didn't understand the translation. And that's what I think. It's a, it's a lack of translation. Uh, and I really believe that. Well, um, I, I, I kind of get upset in that the fact that when you talk about decorative art, it's like if you talk about decorative art and art, one, you're, you're mindless, and the other one, you have a mind. Oh, see, I disagree. And, and, yeah. well, no, but, but yeah. I, that's the connotation I get. I see. Of Interesting. craft. You know, when they yeah. say craft, right. that's why. My definition of art is when I walk into a museum or somebody's living room and it raises my blood pressure, I know it's art. I don't care if it's a tea bowl or whether it's a painting. That's very good. And, and that's really the way I judge art. I like for that. Myself. And uh, another thing, I, I think this whole thing with uh, materialism, I, th I, I really like the way that Dan's been able to observe this, this, this what happened after the war. And one thing great about the United States is that we have, we're such a young country, we didn't have a history. And we didn't have to have, you know, 2,000 years of porcelain tradition that we had to, you know, father to son had the same design over and over and it changed by, by millennia, just like by hair of a line. And uh, in the United States, you know, we didn't have, like when I was uh, in school, we didn't know, the reason why we started doing all these glaze exper experiments and kill experiments, because we didn't have anything to follow. And the, uh, what happened, these workshops started going all over the United States, and people started demonstrating what they knew, because there wasn't anything written, particularly. Right. And, and that, then that workshop just could, took off, it still goes today. But the fact that the United States didn't have a tradition probably was a gift. Because that made us think outside the box. Not and according to Bernard Leach, though, he <laughs> chastised Americans for not having a taproot, and the response was, that's what gives us our strength. No, that's true, because yeah. you can actually say that about studio jewelry as well. The, in yeah. fact, the Europeans were always very jealous of the fact that we had permissiveness and freedom within our making, um, looking at the body. And of course, I mean, not to say that Europe isn't uh, advanced and, and, and forward thinking about their work, for sure they are, but there was a moment there where we were ahead of them in, in terms of our expressiveness in that material, um, absolutely. Um, but at the same time, I, I truly feel that there, there are traditions, maybe not, maybe more of a native uh, nature, but I also feel that, that there is a connective tissue to the past um, and maybe some of them were more in industrial concern, but after those at, coming out of industry also came some great work. I mean, you think of the work oh. of Wayland Gregory, who worked um, in the factories to create architectonic sculpture, and it was all extremely streamlined. But he 
he broke away. He built his own studio. Uh, he, bought, he built a, a nine-foot kiln, and he was the first, I feel, uh, is the forefather of monumental ceramic sculpture in this country. He's just an unsung, unserved hero. Um, and so it's a matter of, again, as a historian, tying it to those, <coughs> those pre-war uh, makers and, and tradition. Um, and, you know, I think, like I said, there's a lot of work to be done, and this conversation is a very important one. Um, I, I don't want to cut it short, but it is noon, and I know we are on a time schedule, and I know you guys like to ask questions, that's what I've heard. So I'm just going to stop for a second, and I ask if you have a question, let's go to the mics, please, and please ask. And here's one on our right, or your left. No, she's no maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can't tell whether you can hear me. Can you? Yeah, a little bit louder, please. A little closer to my mouth. Thank you. There you go. Um, Phil and I are clay people and jewelry people and a little bit of wood people. Okay, but my wonderful husband has, for many many years, made the distinction: the things we collect are object art, and that seems to me a wonderful contrast to abstract art. There's nothing abstract, even though, even though the, all the work is full of ideas and obviously based on concepts, it's object art. So that's my contribution. Everything you've said is wonderful, but I don't think we should be stuck in old no, no, uh, categories. So that's what everybody's saying. Thank you, Mark. I think if um, you know you look at some of the very well-known um, abstract uh, expressionist artists, uh, um, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce the name correctly, but Mark de Severio. So, is is he a steel sculptor, <laughs> or is he an abstract expressionist sculptor who worked steel, but also worked in wood and bronze? I mean, Dan, even yourself, are you a mixed media artist because you combine bronze and steel with your glass? I think it's, I think the period of, the post-World War II period in the United States is important because of the change in the way people learned how to do their art. And um, that, that's a distinct difference. And some people used a single medium, but for centuries, some people have used only bronze, only marble, whatever in their work. And others have gone from medium to medium or combined medium, media in single objects. And so I'm not sure if the distinction that we're making um, is really that new. I think the educational process was different, but I'm not sure that the end product is really all that different. Well, I, I just think that we tend to use too many adjectives in craft. I think we need to just say yeah. artist. I think we need to say sculptor. And, yeah. and if you ask what is, you know, when you ask, an, um, when I meet a, a sculptor in the, you know, of a, you know not within my field, um, I'll ask them, what is your medium of choice? Uh, you know, do you work in steel? Do you work in wood? You know, um, I think we, we differentiate too much sometimes, and that's been part of our problem. Um, you know, to answer your question, that example, Mark Severo is a good example. He would call himself a sculptor, I'm sure of it. Um, but any one of his works can be in any one of those um, materials. And I think any of these people who are makers here on the podium, you know, you know Dan happens to work in glass, but he's a sculptor, and we could go down the row here. So, I mean, um, that, that would be my response to that. I, I do think that the materials have been inspiring to just about everyone that I've interviewed, and it seems apparent in uh, what the artists here are saying, too. And um, I was just thinking about um, a show of David Smith that Linda and I saw at the Guggenheim a couple years ago, a few years ago now. And we saw one at the Hirshhorn yesterday, and I was looking at it and thinking about it, and 
Albert Pelly would never approach metal that way. You look at him moving the steel and watching the hot steel and immediately jumping over to do something to it while he's making a piece and thinking about the way the particular things are happening on the surface and within it because it's at a certain temperature. He, he knows by color what, you know, how it's going to behave in a press or in a, in a uh, you know, in another device he uses to form things. I think his understanding of the material is deep and it's a reaction to the material that caused him to work the way he did. And he would, I believe, say that. I, I think I'd be fair in speaking for him that way. So, uh, like a lot of other artists who have been trying to describe and who we're all thinking about, the material at some level has been a kind of, uh, Patty said it today, that um, Clay got her. And Bill Daly definitely was mm. captured by Clay. Thought he'd be a painter, has you know, friends, Jules Olitsky, Philip Guston, you know, painters. Um, he, Clay just took him, and so he learned the traditions. And then he didn't want to make a thrown pot on a wheel. He wanted to pinch it and move it and make it into a form and sculpture and, and so on. So at some level, all these traditions have come together to um, become a palette. And in, Elizabeth's comment about industry is also very interesting to me. I work in quite a lot of factories now, I don't know how many, but use them to produce my work and use the expertise and the, the scale of facilities to produce something that I can't produce and in a facility I don't want to own. But it's incredible what humans are capable of doing and excellent skill is a major resource. And um, in my own case, you know, I'm hung up on detail and perfection. You know, I like mm -hmm. stuff that's made well. So that's my predilection. You know, it's not the, uh, certainly not the rule. Artists don't, can't have rules. If you have a rule, then it's right there to be broken. But, you know, everybody has their own approach. Okay, we'll take a question on the right. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, I want to say that this has been one of the most meaningful panels that I have ever had the pleasure of attending at a Renwick function. And it begins, interestingly enough, of the fact that, um, as Elizabeth has said, we needed to have a certain amount of space and time uh, to reflect back on a history and then begin to look at the relevance of all this. I remember years ago uh, when I was first discussing this sort of thing and people who were having the art versus craft debate, mm -hmm. my comment at a conference was, uh, we just need a little bit of time. This was 1975 or so. <laughs> and I felt that um, we needed to have a new generation of curators who had the experience of this material as part of their training in the same way that we look at our three-year-old grandkids now and say, isn't it amazing they know just how to work a computer and how did they learn that skill? It becomes part of their innate uh, operating systems in their brains. And so that next generation of curators is now at the point where they are now becoming in places in their institutions that they have and can speak with authority and they can direct things to be said and understood and make that case. But I think um, what's interesting about this panel and some of the things I've made notes about, uh, I was thinking as, as Glenn was speaking about the, the, the business of being a composer and that skill, that is a skill. Um, and I think that the issue of the materials uh, is really something that is not so important, although it is important, but I mean it's the, um, the materials uh, in service to an idea. And I think that one of, the, one of the things that I observed and one of the reasons I really was very interested in contemporary textiles was that I was feeling that textiles lent that flexibility to maneuver very, uh, very effectively in very many different ways, but come out in the end with something that really was uh, an examination of a person's compositional skills. And I'm, I think that's true of many of the artists that we look at today, and certainly all the ones that Dan cited. Dan's project, I didn't know about the project, but I think it's an extraordinarily important project because it begins the next step of all of this for all of us that have devoted, as my wife and I have, uh, almost 50 years 
uh, in looking at and, and exhibiting this material. But I think that in the end, um, what reflects back in a comment that Patty just made, um, I was thinking about, did it grab you? Um, and I think that the thing that we're talking about here is the materials and the emotional properties of the material. I mean, if I, if I refer back to fiber for a moment, it's because it's the thing that we've had next to our bodies since we've been on the earth. And I think that that connectedness, the emotional connectedness, how these things move us emotionally is a very important part of what the craft movement has brought to the attention of uh, people in the world today. I mean, we went through and looked at a long period of time in which the notion of concept of the ideas being almost self-referential were the subject matter of world art. And I think back about the fact, and I've had this discussion with friends of mine, well, okay, we've been doing this kind of approach to art for maybe the last 50 or 60 years, and where does that stand in 10,000 years of human beings making things? Well, that's very well put, and so uh, thank you, Rick. I'd like to have a last, que last question. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And my question focuses on... Put your on, mic closer. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question focuses on the international dimension and influences. In your presentations, which were just wonderful, raised my blood pressure, as well as my heart and mind, um, between the Japanese influences or trips to Mexico or curating overseas, as you look to the next generation of artists, I'm wondering what's going on in the schools, whether it's ASU or Cranbrook, and how the technology and the shrinking of the global village is affecting the influences of upcoming artists um, and what is being taught in schools on the international level, opportunities to physically travel, but what you see in technology of bringing the world to students and future artists and affecting work, if you could speak a bit more to that dimension. I'd like to answer that to, to uh, some degree. That's why it was so, I felt it was so important to establish our own art history program in the, fab, in the fabric design area because, you know, there may be a mention of one tapestry in one lecture uh, on Renaissance art and so on. So that was one way to expose my students to, <clears throat> especially to Japanese culture today, but also the world culture of where we came from. You know, from the Stone Age, from those sculptures that were early on, or those fragments of fabric that were found by archaeologists. Then, in addition to that, I established a study abroad program in Japan. Uh, and for 10 years, took my students, or students from other American universities, to Japan, exposed them to everything in, in Kyoto culture in one week, and then had Japanese teachers teaching them courses that were not available on my campus or that I could teach and also allowing them to interact with Japanese art students. And I felt that in both of those ways of having native uh, craftsmen, artists, who I knew, uh, and translators when necessary, to have them have that experience of that kind of international you know, <coughs> exposure was really important. And I, and I hope, eventually, over the years, somehow I can feel that that was you know, kind of uh, really important to these students. Well, they have already said so, but in terms of their work, it's another issue. Yeah. So much has changed, and you know, the internet obviously has had a major impact, but uh, you know, when I was studying, uh, you know, there were very few artists going overseas. You know, there were certain examples, uh, but now there's so much uh, fluidity, uh, both American students going overseas, so at ASU, all the grad students have been to Jing de Zhen two or three times. Uh, <laughs> they've been to Hungary. Uh, but vice versa, there's a lot more international studies, uh, students in our program. So half of our uh, MFA ceramic program now are students from China and Japan and elsewhere. Uh, so it's really uh, been expansive. And I think I always encourage people to travel. I've learned so much myself observing other cultures firsthand and their artwork and customs. It's uh, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you.
So I think okay, we're going to wrap gonna, this up. And yeah, Barbara, go ahead. Please. No, no, go ahead. All right, I know they probably want to get us to stop, and I know we want to get a picture of the whole group, but if you want to continue the conversation, the panelists are going to be having lunch in the courtyard, and you're welcome to go to the cafe and get buy your own lunch and come and talk with them. It'll be an, a whole open thing, because there's lots and lots to talk about. This has been wonderful. Thank you all, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for making it easy.